discussion about enrolling in a university course. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Registrar's office, this is Pam. Yes, hello. I'm calling about enrolling to study at the university. This is the right number? Yes, this is Mitchford University Admissions. What would you like to know? Well, basically I need to know what I have to do to be enrolled as a student. You see, I'm currently studying education at another school I've just finished my first year, but I'm not really enjoying it. I think I'm more interested in accounting. My dad teaches maths, so I thought it might be a good choice. Well, better than business anyway. Okay, okay. Have you received a registration pack? No. How can I get one of those? Well, you've got to have one to register. You can enroll at the university at any time after you receive a registration pack. These are usually available from September for first year and transferring students and from November for returning students. On the basis of the information contained in the registration pack, you should attempt to make a firm choice about which courses to study before completing your form. I see. So I've only got a month to get my registration pack in. Can you send me one? Sure. If you are close to a high school, the registration pack and university prospectus are available from the careers advisor. Would that be helpful? Well, the closest school's too far away and I haven't got a car. Are there any other ways you can send it to me? Well, for prospective students who have already left school, the registration pack and prospectus are available from the university information line. But that might not be of help for you? No, not really. I'll tell you what, why don't you give me your contact details and I'll send a pack out to you. At least that would be a start. Okay, sounds good. Right. Firstly, what's your name? Richard Dreyfus. That's D-R-E-Y-F-U-S. Your address there, Richard? Unit 12, 15 Sportsman Avenue. That's S-P-O-R-T-S-M-A-N, Mermaid Beach. Four double five four. And your telephone? Yes, I won't give you my home. Mobile's best. Uh, oh four one four. Hang on a minute. I don't call myself usually. Uh, I think it's oh four one four six five eight three three nine. Yes, that's it. Okay. Now, do you have email? Yes, I do. It's Dreyfus, my last name, at Igo. That's I G O. Dot com. All lowercase letters, of course. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Okay, that looks fine. Now, do you have any questions for me? Yes, I've got a friend who is interested in studying at the university. I'm not sure what would be best, uh, the best way for him to register. Can you give me some suggestions? Sure, there are three ways to register. Option one is telephone registration. Before you telephone, fill out the registration form included in your pack. This will ensure you have all the information that you require. The number is in your registration packet. Don't forget to hold on to a copy of your registration form for future reference. Yep, yeah, okay. Option two is registration by post. All you have to do there is complete the relevant sections of the registration form and post the completed form together with all documentation required in the envelope provided. All right. The third way is to simply come in. Visit the Student Information Center in the Information Services Building and your friend will receive personal assistance on how to complete his forms. Thanks very much. You've been most helpful. You're welcome. Good luck with your future studies. That is the end of part one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. So, Enrique, have you started your research project on cities yet? I've done a bit of reading around the topic and made a few notes. But, if I'm honest about it, I really haven't done as much as I'd have liked to because I'm finding it a bit difficult. <laughs> you don't know how relieved I am to hear you say that. I feel the same way. I think the key is to be able to make valid research questions. You're probably right about that. Didn't we have some lectures on how to write research questions? I think it was towards the beginning of the term. Yes, we did. I've got my notes somewhere in this file. I tell you what, why don't we look at the notes together and then try and come up with some research questions? At least that would be a good starting point. Give us some sense of where we're going with this. Brilliant idea. Let's get started. OK. From what I remember, a good research question is all about knowing from the outset what it is you're trying to find out. Yes. And now that I'm looking at my notes again, I see I've written here that it's to do with understanding and Evaluation. So, understanding a particular issue and evaluating any problems around it. And of course, a very important part is not overlooking any research that has already been done. Past research is just as important as what is being done now. It's a bit, I suppose, like looking at the research that's already been done and seeing if it agrees or disagrees with your own ideas. Mm, sure, I hear what you're saying. But to do that properly, you have to have a clear idea in your head what your own research question is. And by that, I mean uh, specific areas you want to focus on. Let's face it, there's so much information out there and we can't possibly include it all in 2,000 words. Oh, don't remind me. The thought of writing 2,000 words at the moment seems like a huge mountain to climb. I know, but let's try to make a start. I think we're meant to be identifying what makes a successful city and also try to explain why there has been such a steady population movement of people from rural to urban areas. But I'm a bit confused because I don't think this is meant to be the main focus of our research. Mm. Perhaps that's why the lecturer said we need to write questions and that must be our starting point. OK, well, what we're investigating is more than simply what elements make a city successful, but we're also trying to offer possible explanations. So we have two questions. Why do people want to move to cities? And why do people choose to live in them? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. OK, then. I think the first issue concerning successful cities must be the economy. Uh, people move to cities for better job prospects, and successful cities are cities that have thriving economies. That's true enough. It does mean that cities can offer good job opportunities, which seems to me to suggest that a city will only be successful if it attracts the right kind of people to work there. What kind of person are you talking about? Well, I suppose I'm referring to the skilled labour force. You know, the idea that up-and-coming young people will move to cities, settle there, maybe buy property, and so that city will get the most talented creative minds. But if a city doesn't offer this, then obviously it will lose out, as university leavers will choose elsewhere. You could be right there. But I also think that when cities encourage businesses to develop, then you obviously have money pouring into the city, which can raise the general standard of living. So we've definitely got a question worth investigating. But apart from the economic factor, I think another point worth mentioning is the environment. Sure. We can research areas like the quality of the air, how clean it is, and then there's traffic. Um, is there too much traffic? How is it controlled? And also the issues of noise pollution and how the city manages its waste. Um, oh, and I nearly forgot. The environment includes green spaces like parks. Those are all valid points. But I think you've overlooked the whole issue of beauty. Beauty? Are you sure? What's beauty got to do with the environment? Well, don't you think if you were deciding whether or not you would live in a city, your first impressions would be made with your eyes? So, the buildings in a city are really important. If the entire city looks like a concrete jungle, then it's unlikely to make people want to live there, is it? I think... Successful cities are those which have managed to strike a balance between old buildings and new ones. So, of course, you'd have some buildings reflecting more modern architecture, but others that haven't lost their character and still represent the past. You're right, actually. I've often thought that buildings tell a story. I mean, you can tell the history of a place by looking at the buildings. I know exactly what you mean. And let's not forget that the environment includes cultural aspects. So, for example, what's the cultural life like? For me, a successful city will be attractive because it will have lots to offer, like a good nightlife and a wide variety of places to visit in the day, like museums and galleries, places like that. True, true. My own view is that some cities have an energy about them that's exciting to be in. And other cities are the opposite. Well, we've covered so much ground here. But I think there's one final aspect we should research. What's that then? The social aspect. Because, let's face it, cities are made up of people. They are. And surely a successful city would be one where there is a sense of community, a place where people would feel safe and want to raise families in. This topic is limitless. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Here an interview conducted by an interviewer Spiegel with a scientist, Peter Piot, who discovered Ebola, a dangerous disease. Both of them are conversing about the disease and its origin. 
first, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Professor Peit, as a young scientist in Antwerp, you were part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus in 1976. Can you tell how did it happen? I still remember. Some day in September, a pilot from Sabina Airlines brought us a shiny blue thermos and a letter from a doctor in Kinshasa in what was then Zara in the thermos. He wrote there was a blood sample from a Belgian nun who had recently fallen ill from a mysterious sickness in Yambuku, a remote village in the northern part of the country. He asked us to test the sample for yellow fever. These days, Ebola may only be researched in high-security laboratories. How did you protect yourself back then? We had no idea how dangerous the virus that we were dealing with was. And there were no high-security labs in Belgium back then. We just wore our white lab coats and protective gloves. When we opened the thermos, the ice inside had largely melted and one of the veils had broken. Blood and glass shards were floating in ice water. We fished the other intact test tube out of the slop and began examining the blood for pathogens using the methods that were standard at the time. But the yellow fever virus apparently had nothing to do with the nun's illness. No, and the test for Lassa fever and typhoid fever were also negative. What then could be? Our hopes were dependent on being able to isolate the virus from the sample. To do so, we injected it into mice and other lab animals. At first, nothing happened for several days. We thought that perhaps the pathogen had been damaged from insufficient refrigeration in the thermos. But then, one animal after the next began to die. We began to realize that the sample contained something quite deadly. But you continued. Other samples from the nun who had just died arrived from Kinshasa. When we were just about able to begin examining the virus under the electron microscope, the World Health Organization entrusted us to send all of our samples to a high-security lab in England. But my boss at the time wanted to bring our work to a conclusion no matter what. He grabbed a vial containing virus material to examine it, but his hand was shaking and he dropped it on a colleague's foot. The vial shattered. <laughs> my only thought was, oh, shit! We immediately disinfected everything, and luckily our colleague was wearing thick leather shoes. Nothing happened to any of us. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We were finally able to create an image of the virus using the electron microscope. Yes, and our first thought was, what the hell is that? The virus that we'd spent so much time searching for was a very big, long and worm-like. It had no similarities with yellow fever. Rather, it looked like the extremely dangerous Marburg virus, which, like Ebola, causes a hemorrhagic fever. In the 1960s, the virus killed several laboratory workers in Marburg, Germany. Were you afraid at that point? I knew almost nothing about the Marburg virus at the time. When I tell my students about it today, they think I must be from the Stone Age, but I actually had to go to the library and look it up in the Atlas of Biology. It was the American Center for Disease Control which determined a short time later that it wasn't the Marburg virus, 
but a related unknown virus. Hundreds of people had already succumbed to the virus in Yambuku and the area around it. You were also the one who gave the virus its name. Why Ebola? On that day, our team sat together till late into the night. We had a couple of drinks discussing the question. We definitely didn't want to name the new pathogen Yambuku virus, because that would have stigmatized the place forever. There was a map hanging on the wall, and our American team leader suggested looking at the nearest river and giving the virus its name. It was the Ebola River. So by around three or four in the morning, we had found a name, but the map was small and inaccurate. We only learned later that the nearest river was actually a different one. But Ebola is a nice name, isn't it? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now part turns four. to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to thirteen weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six-term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated thirty-nine studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardized test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing, and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system, where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. 
Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed, and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.